Hello everyone, Mr. Air Fusion here for another vlog type thing. This time about Star Wars The Last Jedi. Which is funny because I don't really talk about Star Wars all that much on this channel, despite the fact that it was the very first review I did on this channel back almost nine years ago now with my uh, Return of the Jedi Rescue Operation Equals Fail video, I believe was what it was called. Hold on to your seats, folks, because I am going to review a movie on the internet. I know! Wow, isn't that just so original? Uh, which I still stand by, by the way. If you haven't seen that one, go check it out. Um, but I feel like everybody has been talking about this movie for the past month or however long it's been out now. And uh, so I really wanted to talk about this one. But everybody has sort of their own faction. It's a really divisive movie, and I, I get that to an extent. So that's part of why I wanted to say something about it. But this is not my, you know, my Dragon Ball dissection type of in-depth analysis. This is just me sitting down and talking about the film. So don't expect me to break things down bit by bit, particle by particle, to uh, to really get at the, the true answer as to whether or not this film was good or bad. Uh, this is just uh, a film that's really kind of intrigued me, especially the reaction towards it, so I want to talk about it. But, uh, like I said, everybody has their own sort of faction and their own camp and their own perspective about this, uh, which is understandable given how long Star Wars has been around and how many, how many, uh, pieces of media it has spawned, uh, and, 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 and feels like so many of the arguments, uh, not all of them. I'm not gonna say people don't have legitimate arguments for saying whatever they want to about this film, but, uh, people tend to lump people they disagree with into certain camps, certain types of fans, like, oh, well, you're this huge prequel basher, so you hate this, or you're this huge prequel lover, so you hate this, or you uh, are just happy for anything that doesn't involve George Lucas, so you'll, you'll you know, put aside all these problems because they're not like the prequels, or you're a huge, you know, uh, expanded universe pusher, so you'll hate anything that Disney puts out, and you're just unhappy that it's, that it's not what, it's not what's in the books. Uh, so everybody has their own perspective, so I guess, you know, just because I haven't talked about Star Wars that much on this channel, I should probably at least get a little bit of perspective where I sit before I start talking about the film, just, you know, so at least you'll know where I'm coming at this from. Hey, baby. You can hold my thermal detonator anytime. Wait, wait, what? Because, you know, despite the fact that I don't talk about Star Wars much on this channel, I've been a Star Wars fan for a very, very long time, uh, I'm obviously not a first generation fan. I'm not. I'm not that old. I'm in. I'm in my thirties, uh, so I'm not quite old enough to have been around when Star Wars was first big. Uh, honestly, my my first exposure to Star Wars was Muppet Babies. At least that's the first thing I remember uh, that really sort of uh, got that sort of pop cultural, uh, you know, uh, all those pop cultural nuggets into my head was Muppet Babies because they you know they did a lot of pop culture references in that show. They used a lot of footage from you know, from other movies and television shows in their show. So that's when I first, you know, they had that, they had that, uh, that image uh, in the opening credits of Darth Vader's TIE fighter, you know, chasing one of them down in like a biplane or something. Uh, if I find that, I might put that in the video. I don't know. Uh, so I, I knew about Star Wars from a very young age. Uh, I knew some of the, you know, the facets of it, the, the iconography. But I didn't get into it until uh, 1995 which was when they had the uh, the Faces, they call the Faces VH VHS set came out. And that Christmas was a huge Star Wars Christmas. I got, I got the trilogy on VHS. I got a whole line of the action figures. And from that point on, I was obsessed. I can pretty much quote all three of those movies verbatim. Um, I have, I probably collected over a hundred action figures and toys, all of which are still in my mom's garage. Um... So I, I was a huge Star Wars fan. I went to see the special editions in theaters, and once those came out on VHS, I got those two. I had two sets of the same movies now, and I'd alternate watch. Sometimes I watch the original, sometimes I'd watch the special editions. Um, and and I never minded the special editions until the two thousand. VHS box set came out, which were suddenly just labeled the Star Wars trilogy with no distinction, and I realized, oh, oh, that's what he's trying to do. Uh, it wasn't until he started burying history that I became, you know, big heap original original trilogy purist type, you know, type of fan. 
and started to sort of not like the special editions. Uh, in 2004, I got the, the first DVD box set, even though they had more changes, because I just figured that was the only way you're ever going to see the movies. Uh, I liked them even less. Uh, and then in 2006, when they put out the, uh, uh, the two-disc sets, when George Lucas finally relented just a teeny tiny bit uh, and put, uh, slapped the Laserdisc Masters from 93 onto a bonus disc, uh, though those are the ones that I got, and that's how I that's how I watch the trilogy to this day. Really, is with uh, is with these these releases right here, uh, and they're not fantastic quality by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, they are the best way to watch the original trilogy at this point. Nineteen ninety three Laser Disc Masters, which is really really sad. Um, but I don't have I don't have a great vendetta against George Lucas. I was not a huge fan of the prequels. I mean, uh. I went to the theaters, I saw all three of them, and uh, I liked them at the time to an extent, but they weren't great, but at the same time I don't have like a, you know, George Lucas rate my childhood hard on for them either. I, I still have them, I put them right next to my, my original trilogy back here on the wall. I usually watch them when I watch, uh, do a, just a full Star Wars viewing, I'll watch the original trilogy first and then the prequel trilogy, I don't watch them in chronological order because I don't think that's a really good idea. Um, but, you know, I don't mind watching them. I don't think they're great, but I don't mind watching them. Um, I also read a lot of the Expanded Universe stuff as a kid. I read the, the, the Timothy Zahn trilogy, Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, Last Command, when I was, like, in fifth grade. Uh, I played a lot of the video games, Shadows of the Empire. I have that book as well. Uh, I read several other, you know, Expanded Universe books. Not all of them. I stopped, you know, I sort of fell out of it after a while. Uh, but, you know, I had... Uh, a Courtship of Princess Leia, uh, and then after college, oh, I had the Han Solo Adventures by Brian Daly, uh, and then after I finished college, I collected a few more. I, I read Splendor of the Mind's Eye, and I got really into the, the X-Wing, the, the Rogue Squadron, whatever, you know, that, that series of books, uh, at least the first several of them. I, it's been a long time since I read any of them. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's kind of a, I feel it's kind of diverse. Uh, way of, of experiencing Star Wars, um, but uh, I kind of, I wouldn't say I fell out of it, but especially just given all the sort of drama with the special editions and the things, and it just like fan faction against fan faction, I kind of ended up falling more into Star Trek as an adult. Uh, I, I don't, again, I don't have anything against Lucas, I actually have a great deal of respect for him, uh, I just don't agree with some of the decisions he's made and, and some of what I would consider hypocritical decisions he's made, uh, which is you know what sort of uh, prompted me to make my boy boycott the Star Wars Blu-rays back in 2011, the last uh, real Star Wars-focused video I made. But um, uh, I did like the fact that he, you know, after the prequels, he decided to end it, where it was just like, okay, these are the movies that I made, and I don't really feel the need to make any more of them, so I was wary when Disney bought the property and started saying, oh, we're going to make, uh, as Red Letter Media would say, we were going to make a new Star Wars movie every year until we're all dead, because, you know, I'm, I'm a huge uh, opponent of this kind of franchise fatigue thing, where it's like, oh, we have this property, we have to always, always make things and always, always give fans, always give fans their fix, you know? Uh, and, you know, I, I like the idea that works of fiction sh should come to an end, you know? Um, so even though George Lucas's vision changed all the time, it was 12 films, it was 9 films, it was 6 films, it was 3 films, it was 6 films, you know, the fact that he, he had a decisive stamp that this is the end was fine with me. And I was like, oh, we got to bring this back again. Oh, come on, let's just let's just let it just let it you know finish. But I'm not gonna lie, um, I have liked the films that Disney has put out more so than I like the prequels. To be sure, I loved The Force Awakens. I loved Rogue One. Um, they they felt like they really got Star Wars in a way that the prequel trilogy sadly did not. Um, but then, last month, The Last Jedi came out, and I wasn't going to see it immediately. I, I wanted to avoid the hype. I was, I think I was on vacation. I was, I was on vacation in New England and hard at work on Dragon Ball Dissection December when this movie hit theaters. So, um, 
I was going to wait a while, you know, maybe wait a few weeks for the hype to die down, but then I started hearing stuff about this movie that really surprised me. <laughs> Honestly, largely from, from Geekdom 101, who was, you know, texting me going, Ah, oh, this movie was terrible, you're going to, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a travesty and it betrays everything, but you're probably going to like it, though. And I was like, I don't know how to, how to take that. Um, should I be insulted? By that I don't, but it intrigued me enough that I'm like, okay, the next chance I get, I gotta go see this movie. Uh, so Bertie and I went to go see it, and we both came out of the theater, and um, I don't know what to tell you. I thought it was, we both thought it was fantastic. It's not perfect. Um, I can certainly say more than I can for Dragon Ball Super, which was has always sort of been there are things I've liked about it, but. I could have gone without these existing. Uh, the new Star Wars movies have been good enough that I'm like, okay, you, you've justified bringing this back. Um, I can understand to an extent why people don't like it. Unless you're one of those people who are like, oh, we have too many SJWs and women's in our Star Wars, and back in my day, it was white and male and we liked it. Yeah, th that, those people, you can just, you can just, you know, you know piss right off. Um, but I am not going to be one of those people who assumes that, you know, if you don't like Ray, or if you think that Ray's journey has been too quick and too easy, or you, or you, that you call her a Mary Sue, then that makes you an evil, sexist person who obviously doesn't care for women in Star Wars movies. Um, uh, but... So where do, where do I begin with this? Because there's so many facets of this movie uh, that I find fascinating both from having watched the movie and from the fan backlash to it. Uh, and in some ways I think this might be sort of a response to fan comments about it. Um, but, let's see, um, I guess I could break it down sort of plot by plot because there are multiple plots in this. Um, and again, I want to say, this is not a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination. There are things that bothered me about it, but not enough to make me dislike this film or think it's a bad film. In fact, I think it's probably... Uh, I, I'm going to have a hard time because Star Wars and Empire have always been two of my favorite films. Return of the Jedi is a bit weaker, I've always thought, ever, ever since I was nine years old. I thought it was by far the weakest of the trilogy. But to me, it's always lacked the spark that Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back had. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, he's just gonna tear down the Ewoks or say that the space battles are retread from the first film. Well, no. I'm not gonna say either of those things because I don't believe either of those things. I like the Ewoks. I like the space battle. Um, and honestly, when I was making lists before this movie came out, I was saying that Force Awakens might have been my third favorite, you know, Star Wars movie. It was, you know, above Return of the Jedi, but below Empire and Star Wars. Uh, this one, I, at the moment, I'm kind of willing to say the same thing, too, but it's still kind of too soon to say, I, I would say. I, I don't know where exactly to put it, uh, and I don't know if I really want to try right now, but it has definitely rekindled my interest in Star Wars more than any other piece has in recent years. Like I said, I've become more of a Star Trek fan than a Star Wars fan, but this has made me almost obsess over Star Wars again. I've enjoyed this movie so much. Force Awakens and Rogue One, I saw in theaters once. Rogue One, I bought it as soon as it came out on, on home video. I didn't actually watch it again until about a month or two ago. That was only the second time I ever saw it. And again, I think it's great, but I just didn't really feel like watching it again. I've already seen The Last Jedi twice, which, you know, uh, again, for like the big super uber fans out there who just go to the theater constantly, that might not seem like a big deal. But for me, seeing a movie, seeing the same movie in theaters twice is a really big deal. Um, but, uh, I've, so I've, I saw the movie twice. I, uh, I started, I watched uh, the trilogy again. I watched uh, Force Awakens and Rogue One again. Uh, I, I found the Star Wars radio dramas. I have always had a sort of, you know, peripheral interest. Like, I wonder what those are like. But yeah, I tracked them down. I've listened to, at least Star Wars and Empire, I haven't listened to Return of the Jedi yet. Uh, you know, for the first time. So I've expanded the scope of my fandom. Uh, I went back and played some of my old video games. I played Rogue Leader for a little bit. But then I got into the Super Star Wars games, which I've had for like 20 years. I had Super Star Wars and Super Return of the Jedi. 
and I always sucked at them. I sucked at them so badly. Um, I could never get past the fourth level on Super Star Wars, which is inside the Jawa Sandcrawler. But I, I finally buckled down and I beat Super Star Wars about a week or two ago. Not only that, but I got online and I ordered with box and instruction manual. I got... Almost stepped on my movies there. I, I finally got Super The Empire Strikes Back and I'm, I'm almost done with this game now. So this movie has really, really sparked my interest in Star Wars like nothing else has in a while. Uh, and I know it really feels like I haven't talked about the movie all that much in all this time that I've been on camera already. But I think that says more than anything else. Uh, that, you know, from somebody who was just sort of kind of burnt out on Star Wars after all these years, to going, oh my god, I love Star Wars, give me as much Star Wars as you can possibly let me consume right now, I need more Star Wars in my life. Um, so, with all that out of the way, let me actually talk about the, the film. Jeez, are you, is anybody even still watching after all this time? Good grief. Uh, so, The Last Jedi. There are a lot of plots here, like I said, so how about we start with the, the main one, which is the sort of Luke and Rey thing. Um, people don't seem to like Luke Skywalker in this movie, which is, you know, and, and talk about how betrayed they are, their childhood hero is, you know, is, is so, so low. Not to be confused with Solo, the guy who died in the last movie. But, um, uh, alright. Uh, and I will say... I will say that one of my problems with this new film franchise, uh, this, this new Disney-led franchise, uh, is the whole concept of A New Hope. Which sounds kind of weird, but then you have to remember that I call the first film Star Wars because that's what it was flipping called when it first came out, Star Wars. That's how, that's how we always referred to it until about the year 2000. It was always called Star Wars on all the VHS, VHS boxes. Um, and and the, obviously A New Hope wasn't added until 1981. After Empire Strikes Back had come out. That's not the reason that I'm against this, though. Um, but I feel like they sort of latched onto that idea and sort of run with it to the, to the point that it's become kind of ridiculous. Where it feels like everything is about a new hope. Nobody can be happy for themselves. They all have to make the ultimate sacrifice so that some new hope can come along and, and save them. But it's happened so many times now that it feels like there's never going to be any kind of resolution to anything. It's like, oh, Qui-Gon has, has died, but he can die happy knowing that Anakin is going to be the new hope that brings balance to the Force. Oh, but he turned evil and killed people and has, has now plunged the galaxy into darkness. And now Obi-Wan and Yoda have to go into hiding, but not to worry! Because Anakin's children are a new hope, and they will one day grow up and save the galaxy from the tyranny of the Empire. Except now that there's this new First Order thing, and they all must make the ultimate sacrifice so that Rey and Poe and Finn can become the new hope and save the galaxy from the tyranny of the First Order. It just goes on and on and on and on. And this, at this point, I don't believe that Ray's ever going to solve anything. It's like we're going to have some new films 20 years from now where Ray is all bitter and jaded and dying uh, because... Uh, and now there's a new generation having to come up and Ray has to make the ultimate sacrifice so a new hope can spring... By, you know, and it's just like... Again, it, it goes back to me being happy that there were only six Star Wars films where it's like, okay, it's over. It's done. That's it. We don't need to keep rehashing this. I, I understood why The Force Awakens went with the whole, you know, soft reboot kind of style. And, you know, this was sort of the one. You know, Rogue One was its own standalone thing, but this was really its the, the time, you know, to break new ground. And I think they did, and, you know, I'm getting to that. But um, I, I do feel like with, uh, uh, with killing off Han Solo and now kill. Spoilers, by the way. I mean, please, don't think there aren't going to be spoilers in this. Uh, now with Luke dead, and now with Carrie Fisher dead, it's like I really just wanted at least one of these people to be able to just retire and, and live happily ever after and say, you know what, I've done my bit for the cause. I don't have to die for it, you know? I, I, I've given decades of my life to this, and now I can pass it on to the next generation, and I can just... You know, I, I don't want them to kill off Princess Leia. I really don't want them to. Or General Leia, sorry. General Organa. 
Um, you know, I, I don't want them to say in, in episode 9, oh, by the way, Princess Leia died, and we're all very sad about that. General, like, damn it. <clears throat> uh, she's di- she died, whoever she is, she died, and we're all very sad about that. I, I want them to say something more like, yes, uh, Leia has retired to this wonderful little beach planet where, uh, where she is being waited on by hunky cabana boys for the rest of her life. You know, I, I, I just I want somebody in this universe to be happy, you know? Is that too much to ask? Um, so I can get the idea, and I kind of agree with the idea. It's like, oh, do we really need Luke to be this angry, crotchety person who's turned his back on everything he cares about uh, and, then, and then has to die at the end? So at the next generation, there's a new hope. Okay, yeah, I did that joke already. Um... <clears throat> But, that said, I like what they did with it. I can't really complain just because it's not what I personally wanted. Uh, and it's like, you know, the things they start out with, the the, the big criticisms, like, oh, he had Ray hand her the lightsaber, he tossed it over his shoulder. And it's like, what were you expecting? I mean, everybody says that this is a big betrayal of what The Force Awakens set up, but I don't really get that at all. Um, I don't. In fact, that's really kind of what I expected, you know, just from watching The Force Awakens. When I came into this movie, I mean, I laughed when that happened, but it was just like, that's a, like when she handed it to him, the first thing I thought was, he's going to throw it away. And he did. I, I mean, you know, he didn't, like, it's like people were expecting him to go, ah, yes, you've finally arrived. Let me go on to your standard definition Jedi training. I'm so happy you're here. But it's like, why did he run away in the first place? I mean, Han, I, I just watched, rewatched The Force Awakens. You know, Han Solo says why Luke left. That, you know, his, his you know, pupils turned against him. And he blamed himself for it. So, all of this feels to me like it was set up pretty well in the previous movie. I don't see any kind of significant betrayal from what the first movie had set up. Uh, and besides the fact that I think it's a good story in, in general, it's, it's good, you know, it's interesting, it's dramatic to have, have Luke do something different, to, to not just be, because they, they already put Han Solo basically in the Ben Kenobi role in the last movie, we needed Luke to, to be a different type of character, um, so I like that he sort of split off, I like, I, I, I even liked the, 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 the milk scene, everybody seems to hate that, I thought, even Birdie hated that, but I thought it was great, um, and he's just doing his own thing. I, I like, I love the message that he gives, even though he, he, you know, he sort of gets a more middle ground approach to the end. But you know, the idea that Jedi don't have this monopoly on the light side of the Force, that it's like it's either the Jedi way or the highway kind of thing. I, I like that he sort of takes the fact that the Jedi really kind of sucked in the prequels and turns that into an asset for this film. That they were arrogant. That they were stupid. You know, uh, and. Uh, and gives that as a reason, you know, why, he, you know, part of the reason why he is the way he is now. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with what, oh, no, I shouldn't say that. I do see things that are wrong that Luke did, but nothing that is like, oh my god, he's totally out of character, how could he possibly become this person? Uh, because I, I think, I, I love like the whole uh, Rashomon story thing here, with the, the flashbacks, the multiple perspectives of flashbacks as to how you know, Kylo Ren turned evil kind of thing, and how much of it is Luke's fault. And I think that in, in the end, the, the truth, the, you know, the, you have the, oh, you know, he betrayed me thing, and then, oh, Luke tried to kill me kind of thing, and the truth is kind of in the middle, where it's Luke did make a really terrible mistake, no doubt about that. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that from a story perspective. He had just this quick moment, this quick instinct, like, you know, like, like Obi-Wan told him, act on instinct, you know, where he just pulled his lightsaber out and turned it on, and it just happened to be in the wrong moment. He didn't, uh, you know, he, he didn't manage to hide that quickly enough, that impulse, and he paid the consequences. And, and as a result, you know, he shut himself away. He, you know, he thought that he just made things worse, which he did make things worse. So I can totally see why he'd be the kind of guy, uh, you know, why that act why that failure would make him want to shut himself away. And again, to all people saying, well, Luke would never turn his back on his friends and his family, blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean, again, that the first movie set this up. He'd already abandoned them, you know? <laughs> uh, so I don't see how it, you could be harping on this movie for that. Um, I, I love the, the chemistry between Ray and Luke. 
I don't like the fact that he never really gave the, the final lesson. And he said he had three lessons of the Forest, and I think he only taught her two. Um, but all that stuff was great. The the Force projection stuff um, with uh, how Rey and Kylo Ren communicate in this movie was fantastic. The way they shot it was fantastic because uh, while there are certain Force powers in this movie I didn't care for, um, they set this up really well. I, I love how it was shot, it only shot in reverse angles. And, and Kylo Ren immediately says, I can see you, but I can't see where you are. You know, you can only see the person in the location. Um, first of all, it, it gives a great way to have the hero and villain interact with each other and learn more about each other in a way that forces... You know, it's almost like it's almost like a science fiction version of that sort of trapped in an elevator or trapped in an enclosed space kind of sitcom trope. You know, where you, you have to have characters hash things out, but they wouldn't normally do it because they'd avoid each other. Um, but you, you force them to be in a space together, and they have to actually talk to each other. And I thought this is an interesting way of doing that, of having this, um, uh, having Snoke sort of link their minds together, and so they have to communicate, even though they're, they're not in the, physically in the same place, because they were, they fight each other, uh, but they have to communicate because they're in each other's heads, which I thought was really cool. Um, and ultimately leads to the best moment in this entire film. I'm not much of a hype guy. I'm not much of a person who, uh, has to, uh, who's wowed by big special effects or flashy things. Uh, you know, I thought Darth Vader's scene at the end of Rogue One was, was, was good, but I don't get why it's, oh my god, it's amazing, Vader to kill people and grab lightsabers, and I, I just, I don't get it. Um, so everybody who was like, um, Luke really should have, you know, come to come to crate and and chopped up the first order and killed all the adats and or ad acts or whichever this new version of Walker is. I don't know what it is now. Um, you know, okay, killed everybody and been the cool big you know dick swinging hero of the movie. Uh, but no, no, that I mean, I like the fact we never see two lightsabers clash a single time in this movie. Um, and, and I admit, when Luke showed up on Crate for the first moment, my first thought was, he's projecting himself. He's doing, because it set it up really well. But it wasn't enough that it sort of ruined it for me either. It was like, oh, I, I second guess this movie. Uh, you know, it was still enough doubt in my mind that I wasn't sure. Because, you know, they, they did have that shot of the X-Wing uh, on, on um, Octo. Octo? How do you say that? I don't know. I don't think they, did they ever say the name of the planet in the movie? I don't know. I just read it. Um... So, you know, he could have flown there. That's kind of the red herring of the movie. Um, and, and also, you know, once he actually stood down... Well, once he stood down the walkers and they shot him, I thought maybe, you know, maybe... Because I wasn't convinced that was what had happened. You know, that maybe they got him. Uh, and then once he was fighting Kylo Ren and he did the whole Obi-Wan shtick of, you know, I'll always be with you, stalking you, watching you, <laughs> if you strike me down. Uh, and then when he, you know, when he slashed at him, I was like, oh, they're gonna do the, they're gonna do the stupid, you know, Kenobi death again, we've already seen this. And then, you know, once he was, once he was fine from that, that's when it's like, okay, yes, I was right, I was right, this is amazing. And, and it's like, it made the Force feel special for me again, for the first time in quite a long time, you know, before it became this huge ordeal of, oh, it's a family thing and it's a mini chlorian thing and all the Jedi do the same backflips and lightsabers and like this felt special it's like Luke did something we've never seen anybody else do really take advantage of it was set up earlier in the movie but this was like it's it's logical extension it's you know the it's final form if you will and it was fantastic it was the most satisfying thing I've ever seen that he demoralized the First Order without harming a single one of them. I, I, okay, <clears throat> this is what bugged me about the prequels. Um, I hated, it didn't take long for me to hate the idea of Yoda with a lightsaber, of Palpatine with a lightsaber. In the original trilogy, they always seemed so far beyond that. I know there was, like in the script, the idea of Yoda teaching Luke lightsaber skills. That didn't, that didn't, didn't end up in the movie. Um, 
And while, while the concept really doesn't really seem to have gone that way, as a kid, I always saw that, you know, uh, Kenobi was labeled as a Jedi Knight, uh, Yoda was labeled as a Jedi Master, and I, in my mind, I always sort of separated those two things, not like as necessarily as hierarchical ranks, although they kind of were too, but a sort of a role as to how you use the Force as well. A Jedi Knight was somebody, was a knight. You know, had a lightsaber, who'd go into battle and, and fight off evil, and ha you know, and had the the physical capabilities, you know. Or as a Jedi Master, because we saw Yoda was more of a guru type, you know, a, a a wise, learned figure who taught you more about yourself and and the internal. Um, you know, the people who could, you know, someone who could lift the next wing out and talked about faith and things of that nature. Um, and the Emperor was someone who didn't have to resort to hand-to-hand -hand combat, they just fry you with lightning, you know? It was it was all, you know, they were above that. They were better than that. Uh, so seeing them fight with lightsabers, it just seemed like, uh, they're just doing the same crap everybody else does. What makes them special? Luke felt special to me. Luke felt like he'd passed beyond what normal Force users could do. He didn't even have to be there. He was a master. He was a pacifist. He was, you know, somebody who did more than anybody else could without, again, without even being there. Uh, just, you know, brush, he was so cool. He was so flippin' amazing doing all that stuff. Uh, and I could, again, I wanted these, at least one of these people to be happy, you know? I didn't want Luke to die at the end, but if he had to die, I cannot think of a better send-off for him than this movie gave. That was amazing. Uh, and I am never going to forget that. Um, so, pretty much everything about Luke in this movie was was fantastic. And Mark Hamill gave, a, gave just a thrilling, amazing performance. It was, you know, both, it could be emotional and it, and it caught, it, and it was, uh, Hilarious at times too. Oh my god, I loved that uh, moment where where he tells Ray to reach out with the force, and she just sticks her hand out there. <laughs> he just plays along with it. It's it's hilarious. Uh, so I'm gonna take a break for just a second because my battery is about to die, and I've been going on longer than I expected already. So I'm gonna recharge my camera, and I'll get on to the next the rest of the plots. I mean, was the Rebel Alliance really hurting for credits that badly? I can only imagine the conversation between Luke and Leia after the whole droid thing went down. Well, gee, Leia, that sure was easy giving our friends away. Hey, how about we try to make some money off of it next time? Alright, I'm back. I just plugged the camera in. You know, I didn't want to waste any more time here. Waste any more time not talking about Star Wars The Last Jedi, I mean. Okay, so I covered the Luke plot. Um, I just don't see how it robs him of any majesty or glory. It, you know, it, it's it's a you know, partial deconstruction of him. He's changed. He's grown. He's you know he's slid backwards in some ways, and that's totally fine. I but but ultimately it gave him a very very respectful betra uh, portrayal, not betrayal. That'd be a different thing. Respectful portrayal and a wonderful send off. But there are other plots of this movie as well. <clears throat> And I will go ahead and start with the, <laughs> you know, for the re for the rebellion plot. At some point, calling it the resistance or the first order, it's the rebellion and the empire, which is one of my pet peeves of this new movie, new set of movies, is that they just sort of put them back to square one from the original trilogy, like I've said. Um, but there is a big resistance plot, and that tends to get just as much, if not more, hate thrown its way. Um... But I will say the one thing that I really hated about this uh, was uh, Princess Leia Mary Poppins scene. I was calling it that before I saw other people. Other people on the internet were calling it that too. Either that or the Superman scene. Um, it was kind of a shorthand I used on my own personal social media to talk about what I thought about the film without giving away any spoilers. Because if you've seen it, you usually know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, it's not going to give anything away because you won't know what you understand. Won't understand what it means. But there, there is a point. Where, um, and I, I mean, I went through a kind of a, a big series of emotions here, and it almost makes, you know, it almost makes you wonder if they didn't somehow know in advance that Carrie Fisher was going to die, because it really felt like, for a moment, like, oh, they're going to kill her off right now. Um, 
Okay, so the, the, the resistance is being attacked. Uh, Kylo Ren is in a fighter, and he's about to blow up the bridge of the, uh, of the capital ship, um, which Leia is on. But he senses that she's there and holds off. And it's like, you know, you, there's so many fake-outs in this scene. I, I can maybe say that maybe this movie has too many fake-outs. Uh, you know, too many... I, I like having my expectations subverted, but there are a lot of them in this movie. Um, uh, you think that he's going to kill her just like he killed Han Solo. But then he doesn't. He stops himself from doing that. And there's a brief moment, and then all of a sudden his wingmen do it anyway. And they blow up the bridge... And, you know, there's a big explosion, and she gets uh, blown out into space. And you see her, her body sort of lying there, uh, you know, floating, al- floating along peacefully. And, and my, my first thought is, uh, they, really, they really did kill her off. <clears throat> They're going to kill all of these characters, aren't they? Going back to my, my previous assertion, I just want somebody to be happy here. Um, <clears throat> and I'm like, well, I guess I kind of had to see this coming, maybe, but... Seems like a pretty crappy death for a cultural icon, and then all of a sudden, like the her fingers twitch and the music swells, and and then like the Princess Leia theme really swells, and then she like up, up and away back to the ship, and it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, you know, as much as I enjoy this movie, that is stupid, so flippin' stupid. It didn't help that just, like, less, maybe like, maybe a minute earlier, I can't remember exactly when it was in the film, but it was right before this, you know, where Poe was running to his, running to the hangar bay to get into his X-Wing, and just before he gets into the hangar, uh, that gets blown up too. And there's this huge explosion, this huge fireball that engulfs him and knocks him smack into a wall. And my first thought is, son of a bitch should be dead. Like, what are you even doing? I mean, I, I know it's Star Wars, suspension of disbelief. It's, there's no remotely plausible scientific, you know, accuracy in this. But come on. I, I hate the whole trope of you can be this close away from, an, you know, this far away from an explosion and you're totally fine. It just, it just knocks the wind out of you. Um, <clears throat> so to see, see Leia hit by an explosion, too, and then not only be hit by an explosion... But then survive the vacuum of space. I, I mean, you know, despite what I said about Luke showing off the Force in a way I haven't seen before, that's a Force power that really doesn't have any setup at all. It just seems like, oh, wow, that would have been useful uh, to anybody. Uh, you know, I don't... You know, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, the whole Leia being Luke's sister thing was never part of the original plan, original vision, because there really isn't an original vision. It, it was made up during the writing of Return of the Jedi, uh, because Lucas discarded doing his own sequel trilogy at the time, because he just wanted to be done with Star Wars at the time. He'd set up the idea of The Other, which would have been the protagonist of the sequel trilogy, but needed to pay it off with somebody. So he just wrote in Leia being the sister. Uh, and it didn't work in 83. And it still barely works now. That's probably very controversial to say. But it's like, come on, guys. You know, if, if there had been some plan of Luke and Leia being siblings, there wouldn't have been a love triangle in the first two movies. I mean, come on, people. Come on. So, you know... It, yeah, unlike the whole Darth Vader thing, which felt organic and a big twist, this felt like, oh, we're trying to do the twist thing again. And it just, it never really felt like it paid off in any significant way. Um, but that, you know, always leads to the, oh, why doesn't Leia use the Force kind of thing? If we're going to set that up. And this is supposed to feel like a payoff to that, but it really doesn't. <clears throat> um, I mean, at least based on what I've read, you know, what Expanded Universe I've read... You know, it felt like Luke was actually training her. She, had, she, I believe, she had her own lightsaber in the, the Timothy Zahn novels. Um, so, so there was something being cultivated there. Um, but you know, Leia in the movies and in these movies never really felt like she, that was something she really explored. Uh, and maybe she did. You know, things can happen off screen, like Luke can change off screen in thirty years, whatever. Uh, I get that, but. Uh, 
this just felt like it was there so we could have Princess Leia use the Force. And that's pretty much it. Well, that and to get her into a coma for the rest of the movie. Uh, which, there are easier ways of getting someone into a coma than having them survive the vacuum of space and using their magic Superman powers to fly them back to a ship. I, God, I've seen Jedi get blown up in space before and they just die. Like, what? You know, I, I make the joke... No, I shouldn't make this joke. No, I, I shouldn't. Um, I don't know if it's in bad taste. But it just feels like they really... It feels like Princess Leia's only force power is immortality, and boy did they give that to the wrong character. Because obviously we can't use Leia anymore because Carrie Fisher has passed away. So her one force power is being able to survive in the vacuum of space, which amounts to nothing in the end. Um, it's not this setup that she's going to keep using the force. I mean, maybe it was. Maybe that was the original intention that she would have a big role in Episode Nine and be this big Force user. I guess we'll never know now. As it stands now, it's just this really random, out-of-place thing that really annoyed me. Uh, and you know, I like how they didn't even show how she got back in the ship, because that would have been a whole can of worms in and of itself. It's like she gets to... she flies back into the bridge, which, you know, has been exposed to space, um, you know, completely decompressed and flies to the door that would lead to the rest of the ship. And, and lot, like, like nobody even has any reaction to this. They're not like, oh my god, how did she do that? It's like, hey look, she survived! Yeah, let's go get her! You know, it's like, does she do this often? It, it was stupid. But yeah, it's like, you know, they run to the door, but they don't actually show them letting her in because there's really no way they could have without blowing themselves into space. Uh, unless there's like a force field on that door, you know, uh, I don't see how they would have done that. Uh, they don't show it, because they probably didn't know. But yeah, it's it felt really fan y and it just looked ridiculous. Uh, but the whole point, the whole reason they knock Leia out is so we can have the Poe subplot, which is that uh, her replacement, Admiral Holdo, uh, doesn't really care much for him because he just, you know, defied orders and got demoted for doing something incredibly reckless and against orders. Um, and so she doesn't trust him, and likewise he doesn't trust her, so he immediately rebels against her plan, sends uh, Finn and this new character named Rose to, another, to a planet to get, you know, to, to do the hacker. I'll get to that. Um, he does his own thing. He's the maverick of the group. Um, and uh, if it was Leia there, he probably would have trusted her, but since it's Holdo, he's like, oh, she's just going to lead us straight into our graves. I'm going to mutiny now. Um, and so, you know, Poe's whole arc here is learning how to be a leader and not to, uh, uh, you know, and the idea that, that super heroics, you know, the kind of uh, swashbuckling, you know, daring do isn't always the right answer. And I like that idea. Again, it's, it's one of those deconstructions I feel this film does really well really well to a point to a point um but the most part i like it and i don't understand a lot of the criticisms about this this plot uh particularly the uh oh if holdo had just told poe what the plan was none of this would have happened it's, this is this is all just forced conflict and she should have told him and to that i say um did, did you watch the movie because the second he finds out what the plan is that's when he mutinies um, so not only, I mean, she had no reason to tell him in the first place, he's a subordinate of hers, you know, she doesn't have to, she doesn't have to tell him need-to-know plans, you know, there's no reason to tell him, his job is to be a pilot, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not to necessarily be in on, you know, these, these, these plans, especially considering he just got demoted for not following orders, so she has every reason not to tell him what it is, and then the movie proves that, that, that he had no business knowing what the plan was, because that you know, because he was gonna fly off half cocked and screw everybody over. And at the end of the day, um, it's a good lesson to learn. I just don't feel that it was. Uh, they kind of went a little too far with it, honestly, because and I'll get to the 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 Rose and Finn subplot in a minute. But ultimately, they bring back a hacker who betrays them. Um, and through that, the hacker ends up giving away, uh, the part of the plan that would have saved the resistance, 
which allows the First Order to track them and shoot most of them down. So because Poe went off and did his own thing, he got most of the Resistance killed. And yet Leia and Holdo are all like, oh, that lovable scamp, he's just, uh, he's, he's raw clay to be molded and one day he'll be a great lead. No! I mean, okay, like, I, I'm all about forgiveness. I'm all about learning from your mistakes. I'm all about getting second chances. But there are, there are some, some mistakes that are so big that that's kind of the end. You don't get a second chance. Um, <clears throat> and, and getting, you know, staging a mutiny and getting most of your allies killed is kind of a bridge too far at that point. At that point, they need to either stick him behind a desk or leave him behind and fly far, far away. You know, you can't really come back from that. You can't really come back from getting your forces wiped out due to your insubordinate behavior. Um, so it was a good lesson. They just went a little overboard with it to the point where I can't believe that anybody would entrust him with anything ever again after that. Um, but I certainly don't see any problem with the way Holdo behaved in that situation. I think that was great. Uh, I think she was did exactly what she needed to do. Um, and I like the way she exited the movie. Uh, and again, I think it uh, almost, feel, almost feels like Rogue One set, set up this, you know, to field any questions people might have about, uh, about what happens in this movie. Because um, they're like, oh, if you can just, you know, go to hyperspace and destroy a ship, they should do that all the time, man, you know. Um, where it seemed pretty obvious to me that you would need something as big as a capital ship to really cause a lot of damage, you know, unless the shields were down. You know, in Return of the Jedi, you had an A-Wing fly through the bridge of a Super Star Destroyer and take it out. That's only because their shields there are, had just been knocked out. Um, but other than that, it's like we see, you know, at the end of Rogue One, the ships try to escape to hyperspace right as Darth Vader's uh, Star Destroyer comes out of hyperspace, and they just <laughs> smack into him. Probably peaked my audio there. They smacked into him and just blew up, you know? They, they had, had no impact on him. Uh, so it would take a capital ship, uh, which is a huge waste of resources to just take, you know, one of your biggest ships and smash it into other ships. You don't have to. Not to mention, typically, a great loss of life. Uh, this is a very specific circumstance where, it, you know, the, the, the means justify, the, the ends justify the means. Uh, you know, it's kind of like kind of like in Star Trek Three, you know, where uh, it was that very specific set of circumstances. The fact that there were only a handful of people on the Enterprise at the time that allowed them to use the self destruct. You know, when the Klingons boarded and blow them all up. If they had been a regularly stocked ship, they couldn't have done that. So it's a very specific situation here. Now, um, before I go to Canto Bite, I want to talk about Ray again because this is the thing that made me the happiest. Um, I, I I just remember that talking about Leia and Luke. Uh, and the whole, this franchise has really <clears throat> beaten a dead horse when it comes to revelations, surprising revelations. You know, it was like Empire Strikes Back made it really cool with the whole I am your father thing, which, you know, <clears throat> was a real shock and had a real, you know, had real dramatic weight. Uh, it changed Luke's perception. It changed the trajectory of his character arc. You know, that was great. Princess Leia thing, less so. Then you get into the prequels, and it's, you know, they, they really fall into that prequel light. It's trap of um, everybody has to be connected. Everything has to be connected. Yoda and Chewbacca were friends, for crying out loud. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Boba Fett met Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's like all of this, you know, it just it really shrinks the universe down. But it's like, it's what people have come to expect from Star Wars. Is everybody's related to people and everybody, you know, has ties to everybody else. And so for the past two years, everybody's been going, oh, I bet, I bet Rey is Luke's daughter. And, and that's, that's probably what pisses people off about the lightsaber thing is, you know, throwing the lightsaber over his shoulder is, is that they, they want him to go, Rey, my long lost daughter, I'm so glad to see you come here and give daddy a hug, you know? Um... I'm a little bit snarky. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I like to have fun sometimes, and uh, you know it's all in good fun. Um, I hated that idea from day one. 
the moment I saw The Force Awakens, people were saying that, oh, well, she's, she's got to be Luke's daughter, she's, she's got to be, you know, Kylo Ren's sister, she's got to be, be a Kenobi child somehow. I guess they froze Ben Kenobi's sperm and, you know, and saved it for 30 years. Or, <laughs> I don't know. Um... And I hated it. I hated it. I was like, you know, if like I, I, you know, I'm almost to the point where, you know, almost would have ruined the movie for me if she if they'd done that route again. You know, it's like we had all these complaints about the Force Awakens being too close to the to the to the to the original film, and yet you you want that same parental relationship reveal again. Uh, and, and you know, it's like I I hated the idea in general that uh, you know the Force is. Uh, is, is passed down by blood, you know? Uh, you know, there's a difference between, oh, you know, your father was a great trumpet player and you might have that talent too kind of thing to, oh, because there is a microscopic trumpet particle in your blood that you pass down, your entire family has the potential to be great trumpet players, you know? There, there's a difference between the two, you know? And so, you know, as a kid watching Return of the Jedi, I sort of saw it as that the, the former example. It's like, okay, the Force runs strong in your family. That's not saying... That, to me, that wasn't necessarily saying uh, you are strong in the Force because your family is strong in the Force. It's just an observation. It's like, oh, this is the way your family's been. That's cool. But then, you know, in the prequels that, you know, you could tell it was, it was oh, no, 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 it's... This is, it's, it's you know, magical trumpet blood. Um, and I know people, you know, to an extent, were sort of banking on this as as a reason that, uh, you know, that Ray was so incredibly naturally gifted in the Force, and I get that because, you know, I I, I do feel that Ray's journey has been a little too fast, a little too easy, uh, not to think, not to the point that it ruined either of those movies for me. Because let's face it, Luke's journey was pretty darn easy too, in terms of. Getting to know the Force, that is. I mean, he had some great hardships, especially at the, end of Return, at the end of Empire Strikes Back, where he was just, you know, broken and missing a hand, and all this terrible stuff had happened to him, and he'd lost. You know, so that that's a difference. But, I mean, this is a guy who we're told is a great pilot, haven't even seen him do anything pilot-wise up until the end of the movie, has one impromptu Force lesson, and is able to make a one-in-a-million shot that no other Rebel pilot can make, only because he uses the Force. So, and again, in Empire Strikes Back, he has an incomplete, relatively short amount of training with Yoda, which, as far as we see, does not include any lightsaber battling at all. Um, and, and never completes his training for that regard. You know, it's all like, oh, you must complete the training. He comes back, uh, you're done. I came back to complete the training. No, you're done. You're good. So Luke's training was never that you know, that comprehensive either. So I can kind of give this a pass to an extent for that. Um, especially given that she, she beat uh, an injured, morally conflicted Kylo Ren. A very seriously injured Kylo Ren. Uh, not to mention the fact that, uh, you know, okay, Luke was a great pilot, which we never saw until we, until we got the payoff for that. Um, Luke was a great pilot. We actually see multiple times in Force Awakens that Rey is already accomplished with melee weapons. You know, with a pole arm. So I can believe that she could pick up lightsaber skills pretty easily. More easily than Luke, based on that. Um, so that doesn't bother me too much. But to uh, get to the point, I did not want her to be related to anybody. I wanted her to just be another strong force. Another gifted, you know, force potential person, you know? Uh, to not have it be, oh, you have to be a special Skywalker person to you know, learn this. Screw that. Screw that. So, when we got to the point in the film where Kylo Ren is saying, I know who your parents are. I know who your parents are. I'm going to tell you about your parents. You know that? I was I was sort of on the edge of my seat, like, please, please don't be, please don't be what the fans have been, have been obsessing over for two years. Please don't be that. Please don't be that. Please don't be that. And he goes, they were nobody. And I, and I was sitting in my seat going, yes, yes, yes. Literally doing that. Literally doing that. You know, I try not to disturb anybody, but I was just so overjoyed that she was just Rey. Not Rey Skywalker, not Rey Solo, not Rey Organa, not Rey Kenobi, just Rey. And I don't, I just don't get why people would have a problem with that. Um, or how it seems supposedly contradicts anything. Again, I watched The Force Awakens... And, I, and now that I've read some of the the hints that people have picked up on in The Force Awakens, um, 
things that could be interpreted that way. I can see how they would take those ideas and run with them. You know, um, I know, like, like someone pointed out, the, you know, it's like uh, Maz cannot ask, hey, who's the girl, to Han Solo, and then it cuts away as if he was going to say something important. That just seems to be me to be some sort of confirmation bias type of thing. Um, so, you know, sort of like what I mentioned in my last Dragon Ball dissection, where it's like the whole, he has too much of his father in him line from the first movie. You know, people look at that now as, oh, it's because he's, you know, his father's Darth Vader, they don't want him to become evil. But that wasn't what that line originally meant, because that idea had not, it, you know, didn't exist yet. Um, you know, the line just meant that Luke's father ran off and got killed, and, um, and they don't want him to do that by shirking his responsibilities to the farm. Uh, people see what they want to see sometimes. Uh, but I don't see how this contradicts anything that's in The Force Awakens. Nothing at all. I don't see how it contradicts the, the, the lightsaber flashback she has either. Okay, so her parents got in the ship and flew away. So if that even was her, if those even were her parents. You know, this whole idea that, that Ryan Johnston, like, betrayed everything that J.J. Abrams was going to do with this, you know, the, these movies. I, I just, I, I don't buy. I just really don't buy it at all. <clears throat> Uh, do, 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 do. So yeah, that and anything with Snoke. Uh, I guess it's around the subject of fans being disappointed by their theories not being right uh, or not being fulfilled. I guess I should say. I didn't bother me. It did not bother me at all. Um, you, know, you know, Kylo Ren. You know, I feel like you're gonna go for like this sort of re repeat of Return of the Jedi, the throne room scene, and the evil Emperor sitting there and. You know, uh, and, but then Kylo kills uh, Snoke. Uh, and I thought that was great. You know, I, I, I thought it was a really wonderful twist. Uh, and people are upset that they don't know where Snoke came from. Uh, they don't, never found out who Snoke was. Uh, and I just don't really care. I never really cared all that much. I mean, uh, there's a part of me, because I mean, again, I, I'm annoyed by this film sort of resetting the status quo. I would have liked to have seen more of the Republic and how the First Order came to be kind of thing, because it really just feels like, oh, Empire Rebels, let's do that again. So I, I get th to that extent, but like, I wasn't really invested in the character of Snoke. He was just the evil guy, like the Emperor was the evil guy in Return of the Jedi. We never knew anything about him until the prequels. Uh, and even then, we don't really know, we still don't know much about him, honestly. We, we know how he came to power, but we don't know much about him. You know, who he was, why he why he's evil, you know, things like that. It's, he's just the evil guy. He's really there because Darth Vader, you know, was being rewritten as this more sympathetic villain who had to be redeemed. So he needed a bigger bad who was going to be the irredeemable evil guy. And that's really what it is with Snoke and Kylo Ren, looks like, or something similar, where he's the evil guy and Kylo Ren's the one with conflict. Uh, and, and that makes some sense, you know? I, so I, don't, I, didn't, I never really felt I needed to know who or what Snoke was. I, I, you know, so if he's dead, I don't really care. I thought it worked for this story, and that's really all that matters to me. Um, okay, so I took care of all that. I loved the Rey stuff, I loved the Snoke stuff, I loved... Um, Love the whole throne room thing, really, and them fighting over the lightsaber. Um, no, actually, I will say, I actually liked this better than Return of the Jedi's throne room shenanigans. Um, <clears throat> because, based on Rey's journey in this movie up to that point, like, okay, I never really believed that Luke was going to turn to the dark side in Return of the Jedi. Uh, I mean, you know, not least of all because it was the last movie of the trilogy, and there really wasn't anywhere for him to go that way. But also just because Luke had never really shown anything that would lead us to believe he was capable of that. I mean, yeah, there was the uh, the the Phantom Vader in the cave in The Empire Strikes Back, which you know sort of showed like a multiple message. Um, you know that uh, it's supposed to show that you know Darth Vader is his father, but also that you know the evil he seeks is kind of himself, or you know, he's his own worst enemy kind of thing. Um, but I never, especially because the Emperor was just so unsubtle about it. Where it's like, you should become evil. And Luke's like, I don't want to become evil. And he's like, okay, okay, all right, all right. Well, <clears throat> if you strike me down, you'll become evil. And Luke's like, but I don't want to become evil. 
So why don't you try to seduce me by tricking me into becoming evil rather than coming right out and saying that what I'm doing is what you want me to do? It's like, oh, you're going to kill Darth Vader. You are so close to killing him right now. If I hadn't stopped to speak right now to tell you that you were doing something evil, you would have done something evil. Um, and then Luke's like, oh, holy crap, you're right. Oh my god, what am I doing? Throw the lightsaber away. I'm done with this stuff. And, and so it's like, I felt like the Emperor was just self-sabotaging the whole the plan the whole time. So I never really felt that Luke was going to turn to the dark side. But here... Um, because Ray and Luke had kind of butted heads in the movie, because there was that moment where, like, it feels like she's kind of a raw vessel that could go any which way, the way she's been presented. You know, there was that moment where he's like, you, know, you didn't even try to resist the dark side. Uh, where I felt, and, and because she had become sympathetic to uh, Kylo Ren... There were a few moments where I thought that maybe she could turn to the dark side. Much more than I felt ever felt in Return of the Jedi about Luke. So I thought that worked really well. Okay, so on to, <clears throat> on to Canto Bite. <clears throat> Sounds like it should be like a denture adhesive Canto Bite. I don't, I don't know. Uh, everybody hates this plot. Like, oh, this is a completely pointless subplot. Uh, like, all they do is fail. Well, yeah, that's... That's that's the point. I will say I was disappointed at first just because um, for just a moment they they get to the you know, everybody you know, people gambling and their happy music is playing and there's you know some like I'm used to seeing these movies like you know a bunch of a bunch of uh, you know broken down beaten people squatting in caves you know and I was like oh my god there are actual happy people in this movie in this galaxy I never see happy people here. Um, you know, it's like, finally, somebody, people are actually enjoying their lives. And then I'm like, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to like them. Oh, damn it. Um, the whole thing is, oh yeah, they, they go to get this, this code breaker, this master hacker to, so they can hack into the Imperial ship and, and stop it from tracking them. Um, <clears throat> and, and I will say, you know, I don't. Distance in Star Wars has always bothered me. It's like the only way you can sort of assume that Luke had a decent amount of training is to is to try to actually get at least some semblance of realistic travel speeds in there. You know, with the with the Falcon having to travel between solar systems to get to Bespin. I was like, okay, that could be that could have been months. Then they could have been they could have been there for months trying to you know trying to get to Bespin. And that this gives Luke plenty of time to become better at the Force. But you know this movie and most I mean honestly most Star Wars movies are really just you know you can get anywhere you can get anywhere in the galaxy within a matter of minutes if not minutes then hours and that's really what this is is oh we have a matter of hours to get to this other planet wander around the planet find this guy it's a hair find this guy bring him back get onto the ship do our mission there and it's like they really really should have written this as a day like a days or even weeks long chase to make this really actually make any sense so, but again like i said star wars has always kind of played fast and loose with that this isn't star trek i probably am watching too much star trek um but aside from that i i liked it i liked it a lot um, and I honestly, cause you know, ultimately this, this ties into Poe's journey, you know, which is the whole, he's, he done screwed up. So, so the idea that they didn't accomplish anything is kind of a point. And, and so it annoys me that people don't seem to see, see it that way. Or it's like, um, yeah, they, they did fail. That's, that's the whole reason, you know? So it's not just, you know, it, it's not like this sort of discarded subplot. It's not this thing that doesn't have any payoff. It has payoff. It's just not the payoff you were expecting. And again, it's the whole, the 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 big heroic, you know, by, go by the sea, your plant pants plans don't always work. That's the whole point. Uh, and honestly, I was kind of wondering once I went back to see it the second time. Now that I knew that this wasn't going to pay off the way I expected it to, that it wasn't going to lead to a success, that I might find this whole section more tedious. But if anything, I liked it more the second time. I, I find the action, the action was good. The character bits were were good. I like uh, Finn and Rose together. Um, I don't see a problem with this. I, I like the, the DJ character. 
Um, and by that I mean the character named DJ, not that there's an actual D uh, character who is a DJ by profession. Um, I wouldn't have known his name if they hadn't said it, if I didn't read about it elsewhere. Um, but I, I thought, I thought he was a good character. I thought he was fun. I thought he was interesting. I thought that he, um, managed to, uh, uh, have a bit of dimension to him, even though he was gonna, you know, cause usually you have a sort of thief with a heart of gold type of thing, which you sort of seem like they were going to do with this. Um, or, or you might have, um, a villain with some redeeming qualities. Um, but this guy, you know, is very much in it for himself, but he's not a, you know, he, he's not like allied with the bad guy. He's not a bad, bad guy. He's just not a good guy either. Uh, it's just, I'm sort of waffling on that, but it's like, you know, uh, he's not cruel for the sake of being cruel. Like, uh, like, like when Finn, <clears throat> you know, wants him to give Rose's necklace back. Uh, where he's like, oh, that wasn't fair that you, you took that. We're going to pay you, but this is something that's sentimental to her. But it turns out he only took it because he needed that metal to do his hacking, to get into the, get into the room. And at which point he gives it back to her. Uh, but, then he, they, but then he still ends up selling them out later on, uh, you know, when it suits his purpose. And I, I liked that. I liked that it seemed more three-dimensional. Um, but like I said, I don't like how... I don't feel that the message was conveyed properly. This the whole Poe Finn plot of failure being the best teacher. Um, in that regard, I worked with Luke. It didn't work as well here. Because I feel like the nature of the sacrifices um, get kind of muddied, especially at the end. Uh, where it's like the whole idea, because the movie opens with Poe and his group doing this huge daring do thing, which actually works, but it gets a lot of them killed in the process, including Rose's sister. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, sometimes discretion is the better part of valor, that, uh, you know, the sacrifice play is a decent tool in your arsenal, but uh, there's a time and a place for it. And sometimes it's better to keep your people alive when you can. <clears throat> because, you know, the, 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 the Dreadnought, it was a good victory for them. It was nice to destroy a Dreadnought, but it didn't really do much for them. It's like we had, you know, <clears throat> like in the first movie, we had all these rebel pilots sacrificing themselves to get to the Death Star. Uh, which is the only thing they could have done, because if they didn't, then the entire planet was going to get blown up. They were sacrificing themselves for a purpose. Whereas with the Dreadnought, they were sacrificing themselves um, just when they were going to run away anyway. Um, so I, I that was a good setup for that. And then Holdo comes in to demonstrate when a sacrifice play <clears throat> is the right move to do. Um, where where it's not for glory, it's not for magnificent combat. It's you know it's to protect these other people. You know it, it's to protect what you care about, kind of thing. And it's like that's that's the lesson right there. But then when they get to the speeder thing against the the Death Star door knocker, whatever the hell it is, um, and Finn is going to sacrifice himself, and then Ro you know and Poe orders them against it, <clears throat> and then Rose knocks him out of the way. And it really felt more like. A Holdo type of sacrifice. That he was going to sacrifice himself so the rest of the fighters would have a chance at not being killed. Uh, that, that didn't seem like the kind of thing that Poe was doing at the beginning of the film. So that didn't really work for me uh, as, well as, 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 well, as well as it should have. I didn't want Finn to die. Because honestly, Finn is my favorite character. One of my favorite characters in this new, uh, <clears throat> this new franchise. Um, but, excuse me. But, uh, um, I didn't think they really got the message across that way. It really just seemed like, um, we had a plan that might have won, um, but we just didn't do it. And, and now it's a good thing Luke Skywalker showed up, otherwise you would have been screwed. Um, so, I have problems with those plots, to be sure. Uh, the fact that we have, like, just a few members of Resistance left, thanks to Poe. And I will say, I like, oh, I like what they did with Poe in this movie. In The Force Awakens, I 
kind of wish they kept him dead, honestly. That just seemed like the natural course for that movie, where it's like Finn was trying to get away from the First Order. He, he took Poe with him because he needed the help. Um, and met the first person who was ever, ever treated him like a human being, who gave him a name, who, you know, who, uh, who, uh, shared in triumph with him and, and then shared in, in defeat with him as well. And then he dies, but leaves him this mission of, you know, I, I have to get this droid. I have to get this map to Luke Skywalker. I have to do these things. And Finn, with no other purpose now has to complete this mission because that's all he knows to do. That's the only sort of good, driving, pure, motivational force he has. And uh, so I thought that Poe in the first movie was like the sort of fake-out protagonist, this hotshot pilot, kind of like Luke Skywalker himself, you know, who's, who's, who's great and who's cocky and who's fun, and then he dies in the first 20 minutes. So this, this, this sad little stormtrooper guy has to take up his mantle. So I was really kind of disappointed when they brought him back. Because um, I didn't think that really that, that really wasn't in keeping with the spirit of the story they were telling in that movie. But now I'm getting into a Force Awakens review. Um, I like what they did with Poe. I just think they kind of ruined him at this point now, honestly. Um, because he's just he screwed up too much. Uh, do, 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 do. Is that everything? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I haven't gone on for quite a long time now. So... Um, that is that is my sort of off the cuff review of the of the Last Jedi. I almost said the Force Awakens. I thought it was a fantastic movie. Not a perfect movie. I have problems with it. Uh, I I think that uh, it could have used a little more polish. And uh, but other than that, you know, I, I can't fault it just for doing going in a different direction that I personally wanted. I can only fault it for things I think that are. Um, <clears throat> Or actual flaws in the storytelling, and you know, and I have you know, I have total respect if you you know find flaws or the same flaws or different flaws, uh, and those are enough to ruin the movie for you. Because I mean, I, I get that, I get the feeling of coming into a new installment of your franchise, a franchise you love, and feeling that it's moved just a bit too far away from what it is you liked about it in the first place. I had that problem with the the start the new the Star Trek reboot movies. I mean, granted, in my case, I thought it was just because they didn't have a story. Uh, so that kind of, you know, nullifies anything I was trying to do. Uh, and it just turned into a big, stupid action movie. Um, so I get it. I get it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to be the kind of person who says, you know, that all your criticisms are invalid. Or all your criticisms are because you're sexist or because you're racist or because, you know, you, you, know, or, you, know, or because you just can't handle change. Uh, although maybe a little bit more with the last one, I can I see more of that. Uh, but there are certainly people I, I've read a lot of legitimate criticisms of this movie, and I have I have what I feel are legitimate criticisms myself. So I get it, I get it. But in the end of the day, I think the Last Jedi was a fantastic movie. I honestly, cannot wait to see where they go from here. Uh, I don't really care that much about the Han Solo movie though. Uh, I, I guess we'll see how that goes. Maybe I mean it'll be, it might be great. I mean I like I like Rogue One so. Um, so yeah, I think the Last Jedi was great, and I'm glad a lot of the, a lot of other people thought a lot of, thought it was great too. And I just think it would be a real shame um, if they got cold feet over doing uh, more unexpected things like this because of some of the backlash they got for this movie. Because I think this this movie should serve as kind of a, as a blueprint. Uh, for how they should continue on in the future. I, th I, I think that it was great in that regard. So, uh, I will see you guys soon. Bye. This plan is stupid.